A very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here in this session. I am Devulina from Clarnet. We are very much proud to be a part of this webinar as a digital partner. As you all know, Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform, which is exclusively free for all the medical practitioners. So you all are invited to visit our website, which is www.clarnet.com. So now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome very dynamic personality, Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir, to start with our today's program. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dabrina, for the comments. Okay. Welcome. And good evening to you all. We bring you to our webinar of the college on Wednesday evenings. As you know, we are progressing well with our webinars and many changes are being brought. Today's webinar on the mechanical ventilation is going to be the last session on the mechanical ventilation. Next time onwards, Nara and Hadeyala will be focusing on some other area. And today's webinar is moderated and the speakers are introduced by Dr. Muradhar Kanji, who is our Dean and Dean, I welcome Dean to do all the required procedures prior to start the webinar. Before he starts, I like to bring your attention to our ICA conference 2022. It's going to be a national as well as international conference. As you know, we are attached or linked to American Society of Anesthesiologists as well as Society for Ability Anesthesia in US. And we may have tie-ups with some more foreign societies, which we may be able to announce later. So this ASA and Saba will be participating in our program, which is going to be on 4, 5, 6 of November at Chandigarh. I request you to join. It's going to be a really money worth conference. It's going to be a very good conference because last two conferences always were really appreciated very well by everybody around. So I welcome you all. Go through the programs, go through the other arrangements and get yourselves ready to join for the program. And now I request Dr. Murlidhar Kanchi to open up. Uh, my dear colleagues and friends, Ladies and gentlemen, it's an immense pleasure for me to welcome you to this 108th webinar of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. That is 108, what we call as Ashtotara in uh, um, Indian language. It is the 108th webinar of ICA. I'm greatly delighted and honored to host this event on behalf of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Today we'll be having the third module of mechanical ventilation. We started with first module in the month of May. Second module, we did it in July and uh, third uh, June and the third module, module is today in front of you. And uh, we have uh, bright upcoming starts participating in this webinar from Bangalore. And I request Dr. Ratan Gupta to start the proceedings. Before that, I, I would like to introduce Dr. Ratan Gupta. He is a senior consultant in the Cardiac Surgical Intensive Care in Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, Bangalore. He is very academically active and a very experienced uh, personality in the field of critical care medicine. And second, I would like to introduce Dr. Chetan. He is again uh, one of the leading uh, personalities in the field of uh, critical care. Next to that, I'll introduce Dr. S uh, Sanjay OP. He's about to join. He's not at train as it. He's uh, joining us in the next uh, 10 minutes. And then I will be with you all through the proceedings. And uh, please note that the questions and answers will be uh, at the end of the session. And with these few remarks, I would like to ask or request Dr. Ratan Gupta to take over and introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Good 
डॉक्टर रतन गुप्ता As he is not responding, I'll take the honors of introducing Dr. Himal Dev, who is the chief of intensive care at Apollo Hospital, Seshadri Puram in uh, Bangalore. He was trained with us, and then in the Royal Adelaide Hospital intensive care, and his special areas of interest include ECMO and uh, critical care in trauma. Himal Dev, will you please start your talk? He will be talking about high flow nasal oxygen, the role of uh, high flow nasal oxygen in respiratory failure in intensive care units. Yes, Dr. Himal Dev. Good evening, um, everybody. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. I thank ICA and the dignitaries to give me the opportunity to speak on this topic, particularly, which is the topic of. Uh, uh, interest at present. So <clears throat> I will start with no disclosures and let us start with the subject itself. What is high flow nasal oxygen? It, the name itself explains it is a way of delivering the high flows of humidified air with supplemental oxygen through a comfortable interface. So high flows, humidified air and oxygen. So basically three components. So high flows by the use of a flow generator, which is incorporated in the machine, uh, air and oxygen blender, which provides a percentage of oxygen, which is required. And the last part is the humidifier. This is the three components, which are main concerns in this high flow therapy. So what are the effects of this high flow oxygen? How does it help the patient? So this slide summarizes everything. It, reducts, it causes reduction of the dead space. It also produces dynamic positive airway pressure. By doing this, it reduces the respiratory rate and increases the tidal volume. And also it reduces the carbon dioxide levels by reducing the net space and increases the end expiratory lung volume. Along with that, it also produce, provides airway hydration because it is connected with the humidifier. And the main component is supplemental oxygen. So by providing this higher concentration of oxygen along with the high flows, it improves oxygenation as well. Including everything, there will be an increase in the patient comfort. So this is the main concept of high flow nasal oxygen therapy. So remaining slides, I'm going to show you by description of videos, how it is going to help the patients. So first is reduction of the dead space. So this is one experimental model which have been done by using a gamma camera, a radioactive tracer has been used. If you see, as the flow increases, there is a reduction in the radioactive tracer that indicates there's a reduction in the dead space. So by doing this, there is an increase in alveolar ventilation. The same concept applies to the high flow nasal oxygen therapy. The second concept is dynamic positive airway pressure. That is nothing but the positive airway pressure. This is also provided by the high flow. And if you look at this, at the level of low flow oxygen, the alveolar ventilation is not so much, but when the patient is put on the high flow oxygen, you look at the alveolar ventilation, which increases. So that by, by increasing this, there will be increase in tidal volume and alveolar ventilation. And that's how there is a dynamic uh, positive airway pressure, which is provided. The third concept is optimal humidity. As you know, humidity is very important. It prevents the desiccation of the airway epithelium, improves the mucus skills. This concept has been not understood very well, but humidification it, it, act, it actually, actually provides a major role in any of these um, oxygen therapies. So basically this humidifier, along with this high flow, it emulates the natural balance of heat and humidity in healthy human lungs, enables the comfortable delivery of high flows, and also improves the mucociliary clearance, which is very important in preventing the secretions of occluding the airways. And this particular measure shows at a good humidity, that is optimal humidity of 100% humidity, you can see the mucociliary clearance, how it is happening when compared to not so good humidity, 0.90% humidity. So by looking at this, you'll know how much of um, uh, secretions get spent up if you're not maintaining a good humidity in an airway. So high flow, nasal high flow, along with this high flows also provides a good humidity and prevents the secretion uh, accumulation and also helps it clearance of uh, airways. The last concept is the most important concept. It is oxygen. If you look at the comparison between these two, where the face mask has been given and the high flow has been given, 
there is a definitive set FiO2 is delivered to the patient at the peak inspiratory flow. So there is a confidence in the delivery of blended humidifoxin. If you set at a particular FiO2, it is understood that this much of FiO2 is delivered to the patient. So summarizing this, these are three elements of the therapy. One is oxygen. The second one is the flows, which decreases the work of breathing. And the third concept is humidification. And you only have to remember the three settings here. One is uh, the temperature settings, which is set at 31 or 34 or 37. Usually 37 is the optimal humidity range, which is set. FiO2 also can be set between 21% to 100%. And the flow range for the adult is 10 liters per minute to 60 liters per minute. But for the pediatric patients, it is 2 liters to 25 liters per minute. So basically, you need to set these three components, the temperature, the FiO2, and the flow rate. That's the basic setting of high flow. We have different interfaces, adult nasal cannula is available, pediatric nasal cannula is available, and also a tracheostomy interface is also available, which I'm going to explain to you in, in the further slides. So when do we start the high flow nasal oxygen therapy? What are the recommendations? These are the four recommendations which needs to be remembered among the broader range of recommendations. The first one, which has a stronger recommendation is hypoxic, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Rest of the ones are, have conditional recommendation. The second one is the following extubation to prevent reintubation. It is a conditional recommendation. The third one is post-operative patients who are at high risk, obese patients, and also patients following cardiac or thoracic surgery where there is a chance of splinting, atelectasis, respiratory failure, and they may eventually require intubation. These patients, again, there's a conditional recommendation. And the last one is the peri-intubation period where you can avoid apneic episodes, especially in the case of a difficult intubation, the con this there is no recommendation for this, and uh, it doesn't recommend to start the high flow for this difficult ventilation. But if the patient is already on a high flow therapy, you continue this during this uh, intubation so that you can avoid the apneic spells and avoid other hypoxic cardiac arrest. So these are the four uh, indications we need to remember in a case of high flow nasal oxygen therapy. So you start them on high flow nasal oxygen therapy. What are the targets you see, and how do we wean them off the high flow oxygen? And the problem with high flow oxygen thing is not much of complications, but the drastic disaster complication I would say is you delay in recognizing the failure of high flow. Somebody is failuring this therapy, somebody is not responding to this therapy and eventually they may require mechanical ventilation. If you delay it, it is going to be detrimental. So you need to recognize the earlier uh, failure for HFNO therapy. So decrease in the respiratory rate is the one of the important predictor of therapy success. Other than that, there is an increase in oxygenation decrease in dyspnea, decrease in supraclavicular retraction and thoracoabdominal synchrony. So this has to happen within 5 to 15 minutes to 30 minutes. So if this doesn't happen, then definitely the high flow nasal oxygen therapy is not helping the patients. Along with these, this is one um, index which will guide us whether the high flow nasal oxygen therapy is working or not. This is the ratio of SpO2 over FiO2 and respiratory rate. And it, this is called as ROCS index. So where it has to be done, at the first day of high flow therapy at, uh, at uh, two hours, six hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. And every 24 hours, it has to be recorded. And at 12 hours, if the ROCS is less than 4.88, that indicates that the high flow nasal therapy is not helping and the patient may not, should not be continued for a longer time on this, and he should be intubated. HFNC failure was defined as escalation of therapy of res escalation of respiratory support to invasive mechanical ventilation. So especially it is helpful in guiding the clinicians in their decision to intubate the patient, especially when the patient is outside the ICU and um, uh, more, more uh, stringent monitoring is required. So these are the two important uh, concepts, how you monitor the high flow nasal oxygen thing. This is a wonderful slide which can tell you everything about how do you initiate and how do you de-escalate uh, high flow therapy. If you can spend uh, two minutes on this, I think it is quite uh, easy to understand. It has been uh, brought up by Ishaki et al. in his uh, uh, literature. So where acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, there is no criteria for immediate or imminent intubation. You initiate the patient on nasal high flow and you start the FiO2 at 100% and the flow rate at 60 liters per minute and the optimal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So this is the basic settings in this patient. You watch them for two hours and you look for all the monitors, which I discussed in previous two slides, including the ROCS index. If the patient is doing well, reasonably well, and there is no deterioration, then you start titrating it down, where FiO2 is based on the SpO2 recordings, maintain the SpO2 more than 90, 
and come down on the FiO2. Flow rate also slowly we can be um, uh, decreased based on the respiratory rate and the patient comfort and temperature also based on the patient comfort. Again, you monitor them. At the end of 48 hours, if you feel the patient is getting better and your uh, ROX index is good, then you start decreasing the FiO2 and the, when the FiO2 is less than 0.5%, you start decreasing the flow rate and wean them off the high flow. This is how you initiate the high flow, you maintain the high flow and you wean them off the high flow. So this slide actually elaborates very nicely how do you go about of the high flow. But in any of the situations, if there is a other way, the patient is deteriorating and he requires a mechanical ventilation, still you have a high role of high flow because the patient is already on the high flow, you have to continue with pre-oxygenation in these patients with the high flow itself. The setting is FiO to 100% and flow rate of 60 liters per minute. So in every step, the high flow is going to be beneficial um, in, the, in, in this subset of patients. So that's why this acute hypoxemic respiratory failure has got a strong recommendation for usage. What is a weaning failure? It is reapplication of high flow within 24 hours of conversion of high flow to conventional oxygen or patient requiring endotracheal intubation and ventilation. A weaning success is the patient remains stable after 24 hours of removal of high flow into conventional oxygen therapy. Some of the weaning criteria is patient doesn't have any respiratory distress, pH is maintained, saturation is maintained well, tachypnea is not there, tachycardia is not there, and patient doesn't have hypotension. This is, a, this is the indicators of successful weaning. This is the extensive uh, array of studies I won't go through it because of the lack of the time, but I can show you that there are flows which are set at different indications are usually between 50 to 60 liters per minute, except for a few of the uh, indications, like when the patient is at the low risk of reintubation, when the patient has mild to moderate hypoxia, and the patient uh, was indicated not to have any intubation, do not intubate a patient with hypoxemic distress. And if you see here, even in type two respiratory failure with COPD, bronchiectasis patients also, the high flow has been used. Uh, quite surprising because um, we usually tend to go th towards NIV and NIV is the, re uh, the primary modality, but there are subset of patients where the high flow is beneficial and the high flow is helpful in these patients mainly by reducing the dead space, washes the carbon dioxide out, and also it reduces the resistance of the airways and uh, better patient tolerance. And one more thing is it can also provide uh, some kind of dynamic positive airway pressure which can counteract the intrinsic peep of the patient and just helps uh, preventing the auto peeping in these patients. So even in type two respiratory failure, high flow can be used. So this is one message which I would to like to uh, like the viewers to take home. These are the flow rates which has been set. This is the adult nasal cannula and the tracheostomy cannula and the pediatric cannulas. Pediatric is between two to 20 liters and adult and tracheostomy cannulas is between 10 to 60 liters per minute. The minimum is 10 liters and the maximum is up to 60 liters per minute. So again, just stressing on the indication, hypoxemic respiratory failure, yes, strong indication. Pre-oxygenation in a difficult airway to increase the apneic time during intubation. Poor tolerance to NIV mass therapy, or sometimes when the patient is using NIV and you need to give him a break, you can use it as a break therapy from NIV. Sometimes during the pre and post interventions like bronchoscopy, chest trauma whenever there's an abdominal chest splinting, and palliative care when the patient's um, are not supposed to get intubated, do not intubate situation. We can use high flow to tide over the crisis. These are some of the indications. And these are the recommendations which already I described, which have got a strong recommendation, which have got a conditional recommendation. So these are the society guidelines, ESICM guidelines, European Respiratory Society uh, guidelines, all suggesting that high flow, there is a strong recommendation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Rest all the recommendations for other indications are conditional recommendations. Some of the other recommendations are in acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, sepsis induced respiratory failure, immunocompromised patients where you tend to avoid mechanical ventilation and intubation because they are at the high risk of infection and RAP, where you can, uh, sub, uh, you can support them with the high flow machine. And also in the case of post-operative patients where that is a low risk or a high risk, cardiothoracic patients, pre-oxygenation for uh, difficult intubation patients, post-extubation to prevent reintubation, and as a break time for NIV. These are the indications generally, commonly where the high flow nasal therapy has been used for. Some of the studies which support this high flow machine, uh, they have, Frat et al has com uh, compared nasal high flow with the NIV. It's a 23 center study, and um, 
what he has concluded is there is a reduction in 90 day mortality when you compare it with niv and the uh, conventional oxygen therapy and also there is a reduced intubation rate and there is also a um, significant decrease increase in the ventilator free days hernandez et al also uh, did the same uh, similar kind of study where he compiled a nasal high flow with the conventional oxygen therapy and he actually used it in 527 patients at low risk of reintubation and he uh, found out that there is a reduced uh, chances of reintubation compared to uh, conventional oxygen therapy when the patient is on high flow reduced post extubation respiratory failure and the successfully extubated patients had a decreased um, uh, length of icu stay and hospital stay and the most important thing is nasal high flow did not delay reintubation compared to conventional oxygen therapy so uh, by putting somebody on nasal high flow it did not delay uh, further escalation so that's one of the uh, good good concept similar study again by hernandez et al in a patient at high risk of reintubation here the conclusion was the nasal high flow was non inferior to bipap for preventing reintubation and again it was non inferior to bipap for preventing post extubation respiratory failure so all these uh, three studies were in favor of uh, using high flow and high flow also has been compared with venturi masks and uh, the conclusion was definitely with the high flow there was decrease in uh, dyspnea dryness increase in overall comfort and gas exchange was better with high flow proning with high flow nasal oxygen yes we can prone them with the high flow nasal oxygen therapy and we have found it useful so the studies have been done and the smaller study but it concluded that early application of bone position with high flow especially in patients with moderate ards may help avoid intubation further extensive studies are required but there has been a lot of um, anecdotal evidence that where proning has been helpful in case of high flow nasal therapy this concept is not aware uh, for many people even we can connect the high flow oxygen to the tracheostomy as patients by using a tracheostomy interface the principle is everything is same and even the flow rate the oxygenation also is same but uh, this has to be uh, uh, the studies are not uh, more in favor but it can be used some of the other uh, uh, evidences guiding uh, nasal high flow is in preterm infants with more than 28 weeks gestation the nasal high flow has been used uh, as a post extubation um, uh, uh, in a, to avoid a post extubation failure and also as a primary treatment in the case of acute, acute hypoxemic respiratory failures and the dosage in children is usually usually 2 liters per kg per minute is the one which is used and this was actually good enough to get relevant pharyngeal pressure and also to unload the respiratory muscles and reduce the work of breathing and how do you compare it with an niv definitely there is a greater overall comfort uh, than the non invasive ventilation heating and lubrication was better significantly less skin breakdown and also lesser uh, pressure injuries and of course lower lower nurse workload compared to the bipap and the another concept where we think a lot of aerosol dispersion is happening especially in the covid-19 times if you look at this graph uh, hfn flow is very way more down compared to our nebulizers niv venturi mask and the nasal cannula this is the distance in centimeters and if you look at it the aerosol dispersion is not so much as compared to uh, niv or any other mask in case of nasal high flow so summarizing the entire uh, thing what are the physiological outcomes it improves the ventilation and gas exchange reduces the respiratory rate decreases the dead space and reduces carbon dioxide increases tidal volume and it increases end expiratory volume because of the humidification there is an increase in the improvement in the mucus clearance and also improvement in oxygenation if you extrapolate it to clinical outcomes there is reduced escalation of care somebody going into mechanical ventilation or somebody needing the niv has been reduced reduce the mortality rate other than that there is a reduced length of icu stay and the ventilator days reduced cost of care indirectly and definitely there is an improvement in patient care and patient centric outcomes so the most important thing in high flow is initiating high flow is easier but you need to know when to stop the high flow and you initiate them on the mechanical ventilation so all the indices especially the rocks indices as well as the parameters um, uh, clinical parameters can guide us and also the the ishaki et al criteria which has been suggested that can also guide us um, avoiding them going into hfnc failure or delay in escalation of the treatment 
maybe judicial use of high flow is going to be a very beneficial uh, thing for the patient, uh, for the doctors and for the nurses, and everybody is going to be a very happy um, uh, group. And that concludes my talk, and uh, I will take the questions at the end, and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity once again. Thanks, Dr. Himaldev. It was a very nice and uh, comprehensive uh, talk regarding high flow nasal cannula. Uh, can we move to the next presentation, please? Yes, the next presentation will be by Dr. Venkatesh Gupta on prone ventilation. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Venkatesh Gupta. Uh, he is MD, IDCCM, FCCM, EDIC, and he has also done an ECMO fellowship uh, by the Simulation Society of the, uh, India. He has been a consultant in Nara and Rodalaya, and presently he is a senior consultant in the intensivist in Manipal Hospital, Old Airport Road, Bangalore. His special interests are being non-invasive ventilation, hemodynamic monitoring, ECMO, and active involvement in nurse education, which is need of the hour, and neurocritical care. Over to you, Dr. Venkatesh Gupta. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, ICA faculty and uh, uh, Dr. Muli sir for the opportunity. Uh, in the next few minutes, I will be talking about prone ventilation in respiratory failure. I declare no conflict of interest. To begin with, I'll start with a case scenario. A 41-year-old woman presents with severe community acquired pneumonia. Chest X-ray reveals bilateral infiltrates. Hypoxic, hypoxemic respiratory failure develops despite appropriate antibiotic therapy. She is intubated and mechanically ventilated. Over the next 24 hours, her PA would decrease us to 40 mm of Hg, despite adequate ventilator support with FiO2 of 100% and a PEEP of 20 cm of water. This you may come across when you are dealing with patients in the ICU. So what is the diagnosis? It is very clear that this patient is having ARDS because of the community acquired pneumonia. And the Berlin definition, we all know, I'm not going into the details of it. <clears throat> so what do we do in this kind of uh, scenario? The next step we consider is prone ventilation. So what is prone ventilation? So you ventilate the patient in the prone position, traditionally used in patients with refractory hypoxemia and severe ARDS who are on mechanical ventilation, requiring sedation and paralysis. During the COVID pandemic, awake proning has also been used. So this is the, uh, the regular way how we treat our uh, ARDS patients. First of all, you treat underlying cause of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. That is here in this particular case, it is the community acquired pneumonia. Then you institute standard lung protective ventilation strategy. That is a high peak, low tidal volume ventilation. Use diuresis under or resuscitation as appropriate. And then see the monitor, the P by F ratio. If it is less than 150, and you have already used the neuromuscular blockade, high PEEP strategy, that's when we consider prone ventilation. The rest is the advanced therapies like ECMO. So how prone ventilation helps and how is it different from the supine position? So in the supine position, what happens is this is the ventral portion of the lung and this is the dorsal portion of the lung. So the many of the alveoli in the dorsal portion of the lung are collapsed. One is because of the exudative nature of the fluid and as well as the fluid around the alveoli. Whereas the uh, 
ventral portion of the lung good number of alveoli are uh, over distended and here you see the cross section the dependent portion of the lung is generally the affected area whereas the non dependent portion of the lung is the unaffected area which takes part in ventilation here we see the transpulmonary pressure the gradient is much more from the ventral to dorsal here the collapsed alveoli are more whereas the perfusion is more to the dependent area compared to the non dependent area so what happens collapsed alveoli more blood flow the vq mismatch is very significant whereas in prone ventilation this gradient of the transpulmonary pressure is much less because of which the alveoli in the ventral portion as well as in the dorsal area are much more expanded than in the supine position and you can see the affected portion of the lung you know the collapsed areas of the lung are much lesser because of the increase in the ventilation and this is again contributed by the weight of the you know the abdominal organs which further pushes the diaphragm up and contributes to the uh, collapsed alveoli whereas in prone ventilation that transmission of the weight to the lungs through the diaphragm is much lesser another important thing is the heart even the heart contributes to significant weight at least up to 5 to 10% which leads to collapse of the alveoli which is reduced here in the prone ventilation so this is again one of the diagram which shows in the supine uh, position when you take midway 50% distance between the sternum and the uh, uh, vertebral bone the non dependent area of the lung which helps in the aeration good aeration is up to 40% whereas in the prone position the same contribution is anywhere close to 60% so this is the rationale for prone ventilation there is improved vq mismatch so in prone position the pleural pressure is less likely to exceed airway opening pressure thereby it reduces the collapse of the alveoli it causes more homogeneous ventilation reduces the difference between the dorsal and ventral pleural pressures so the compliance significantly improves and thereby the ventilator associated lung injury also reduces because it prevents alveolar over distension so you get more uniform distribution of pleural pressure more uniform compliance more uniform distribution of blood pressure and less cyclical atelectasis and alveolar over distension and there is less lung deformation because of the uh, less compression of the lungs by the abdominal content the lungs fit better into the chest cavity and there is overall improvement in the compliance there are few other benefits though they are all of less importance one is increase in the functional residual capacity improved drainage of the secretions improved response to the recruitment maneuvers in fact the prone ventilation itself is considered to act as recruitment maneuver and there will be improved mechanics of the chest wall in obesity as well so the evidence began as early as 1976 where few observational case reports showed significant benefit by uh, benefit in oxygenation by prone ventilation which triggered interest in considering prone ventilation and lot of interest into the physiology and research went into the next 2 to 3 decades until we saw all these new uh, important randomized controlled trials this is a summary of important randomized control trials so uh, you can see that the initial trials this started in 2001 this trial was in 2001 uh, none of the initial four trials showed any significant statistically significant uh, improvement in the mortality though there was improvement in the oxygenation this trial which happened in 2013 the prosepa trial showed significant mortality benefit at 28 days and as well as 90 days so what happened is there any discrepancy in the initial trials 
Yes. The criteria was more rigid in the proseva, whereas in the previous studies, the in, uh, inclusion criteria was not as rigid. And uh, uh, enrollment into the study was not early in the initial studies, whereas in the later studies, the enrollment was much earlier. And the tidal volume, this is one important uh, aspect. Uh, in the Proceva study, they used the uniform 6 ml per kg of the tidal volume predicted body weight, whereas in all other studies, it was not uh, the standardized. And uh, even the duration of prone ventilation was for a much lower dosage, that is much lower duration. Initially, some in hours, 6 hours or 8 hours. Uh, then came the Mancebo et al. study in 2005, where the duration uh, was considered a little longer, at least 17 hours. And uh, the crossover was much more in the initial studies, whereas in the uh, Proceva study, the crossover between the study group was much lesser. So I'll come into the details of the last three trials a little more. So these the limitations of the initial studies I already discussed. So this is in 2005, uh, where the, this study, whether it is beneficial to administer prone ventilation uh, by instituting the prone ventilation much earlier and for longer period of uh, duration. Uh, and this group of patients had more severe lung injury. The study had to be terminated because the enrollment was much slower and the sample size was 142 patients. But the study showed non-significant trend toward improvement in the survival with prone position. But the post hoc analysis showed considerable benefit in patients who were severely ill and sick, had severe hypoxemia. So this was again a negative study. This created more interest of prone positioning in uh, severe hypoxemia patients. This study came in 2009. Again, showed no survival benefit uh, between the two groups. Then came the important landmark study, which got published in 2013. It's a multi-center prospective randomized control trial. 466 patients, almost equally divided between the prone positioning versus uh, supine position. And they had clearly defined uh, ARDS criteria, P by F less than 150, with FIO2 of at least 0.6%, and at least a PEEP of five or more. And they clearly maintained tidal volume of 6 ml per kg predicted body weight. The primary outcome was the proportion of patients who died from any cause within 28 days after inclusion. So there was a significant mortality benefit at both 28 days and 90 days. So this was a significant uh, study. These are the key features in the Proceva trial. I'm not going into the details, but they uh, strictly followed at least 16 hours of uh, prone session duration. Then came the meta-analysis. They all concluded that the prone position is likely to reduce mortality when you apply it for at least 12 hours uh, in severe ARDS. This includes uh, the landmark trial, the, uh, the Proceva trial also. You can see the you know, uh, trend towards uh, prone ventilation. And uh, one more uh, meta-analysis uh, clearly says the reduction in mortality in ARDS when the prone ventilation is used along with lung protective strategy. Then came COVID-19. The prone ventilation is widely adopted. And one of the studies says that 76% of the patients, uh, the prone ventilation was implemented, but the mechanism, how it helps in prone uh, ventilation in COVID-19 pneumonia is probably slightly different compared to other ERDS. And probably not all patients got benefited according to uh, the one of the study. Then came awake proning, uh, widely used. A lot of observational studies which showed feasibility and efficacy and subsequently many trials, which again showed reduction in the uh, need for ventilation, uh, intubation. But the latest study, uh, which got published in JAMA 2022, 
uh, where they looked at the primary outcome endotracheal intubation within 30 days of randomization was not much different actually. So we are not yet clear how awake proning is, whether it is going to have impact on reduction in the mortality or need for endotracheal intubation. So let us come to the steps of proning. The most important thing is it's the teamwork and the unit should have the uh, confidence and specialization or training, I would say training, which is important in uh, prone ventilation. So uh, the most important thing is rule out any contraindication, have team ready, have the important things available, informed consent, sedation and paralysis, tubes and lines secured properly. Most of the times it is manual here. We do not have any specialized beds and at least consider prone ventilation for 16 to 18 hours. So the most important thing is absolute contraindication. The only absolute contraindication probably is final instability, but we have had incidences where if it was inevitable with great precaution, we have even considered prone ventilation in such patients where lungs were significantly affected. Uh, apart from that, I don't think there is any major specific, even in pelvic fracture where there was a uh, uh, X fix done, which was subsequently removed after some stabilization and we had to prone such patients because if not that, then what else we are going to do? Complications we have to keep in mind, the nerve compression, crush injury, venous stasis, dislodgement of the endotracheal tube, vascular catheters, and the movement of the diaphragm, pressure source, the retinal damage, transient reduction in the arterial oxygen saturation, vomiting, transient arrhythmias. But with the due care, all these complications are much lesser. And before I start the video, I, I, the take-home message is prone ventilation is beneficial in an intubated patient. Uh, let us see the video. This is uh, again not from our unit. This is one of the standard unit from any JM. I have downloaded this. It is available online also. Proning. So most of your patients uh, will be on very high supports, intubated. Uh, many lines, make sure that all the lines are secured well. ET tube is secured very well with double tie. You can have your own institutional protocol and make sure that there are not too many unnecessary connections. And we need at least three people and probably in our units, our little untrained units, maybe better to have four to five people and with good coordination. So one person uh, act, should act as a team leader, preferably at the head end. He will be guiding. And this generally happens in uh, two to three, uh, three steps, preferably. First, you secure all the lines appropriately. Make sure that the ventilator tubings are, uh, the ventilator is close uh, next to the cord so that the tubes do not get pulled. And one person at the head end and all the pressure area should be properly padded. Eyes should be properly closed so that no injury happens. So generally we take the patient to one side, horizontally to one side, preferably the closer to the ventilator side then push the left hand below the patient. Make sure you introduce new cloths during the same time, new bed sheets, the fresh bed sheets. Then you turn the patient to the side, adjust all the sheets, remove the old clothing, 
and connect the ecg leads and then you prone the patient with the help of bed sheet you can see that the three uh, trained nurses do it without much hassles in our unit we tend to have four or five and we generally try to use pillows also but that is not mandatory we just have to make sure that abdomen is not tense and neck position should be changed every second hourly that is very important the only observe study uh, the only difference by uh, supporting the tummy is improvement in the functional respiratory capacity you can do either ways without pillows or with pillows below the chest and near the genital areas then once you terminate the prone uh, once the session is uh, once you have given adequate time we look for the response and then this is again from prone to supine similarly you turn to the side connect all the monitors again change the cloth uh, bed sheets with the help of bed sheets you pull the patient thank you yeah thank you dr venkatesh gupta it was a very nice presentation particularly uh, seeing the physiology uh, of prone ventilation how it improves the Uh, lung ventilation and recruitment uh, so now we'll go to the next presentation that is on uh, until now we have seen uh, what will we are more concentrating on oxygen so what should be our targets for carbon dioxide in the patient with an ARDS so our next presenter is dr samir bansal so he is an uh, md dnb Uh, EDRM along with an IDCCM. He is a consultant pulmonary and critical care uh, medicine and interventional pulmonology at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. He has overall twenty-three publications in national and international journals, and he has two chapters in books. So areas of interest are uh, inflammatory lung diseases, interventional pulmonology, hemodynamic hemodynamic monitoring, and mechanical and non-invasive ventilation. so over to you dr samir bansal so let's see how we are managing carbon dioxide in acute respiratory failure thank you uh thank you dr chetan for the introduction so uh i hope i'm audible loud and clear to everyone and my screen is visible yeah you are uh, audible and your screen is visible okay thank you so uh thanks dr venkatesh for that lovely talk so my talk would be on permissive hypercapnia and acute respiratory failure so briefly what i'll be covering is a brief uh, you know small introduction to uh, permissive hypercapnia various pros and cons the evidence and mainly a uh, guideline on how to really practice or you know how to rather go about permissive hypercapnia so first of all an introduction what exactly is permissive hypercapnia so it's mainly an acceptable hypercapnia or an acceptable uh, tension of carbon dioxide in blood which arises as a result of various lung protective ventilation strategies now yes it's not a typical initial goal of mechanical ventilation rather it is permitted now this is due to a uh, lung protective ventilation strategies which could be for various conditions mainly for acute respiratory distress syndrome also for copd and asthma exacerbation now that is mainly to reduce the auto peep and the subsequent dynamic hyperinflation what it does not include is actually patients with chronic hypercapnia whose major target of ventilation is reduction of carbon dioxide so all the other patients who we rather use a lung protective ventilation strategy it the except i mean the hypercapnia resulting because of that that is something which is called as permissive hypercapnia 
So this was described actually way back in 1990 by Hickling. So he's got multiple papers out there. Uh, you know, this was one of the papers which I've quoted over here, which is pre pre uh, in clinical intensive care. Now, major review came in as a state of art, uh, state of the art article in the Blue Journal or American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. This was way back in 1994. And till date, a lot of people, I mean, this remains one of the most cited articles. So probably you can go ahead and read that later on. So uh, the question arises, how safe is uh, this hypercapnia, which results uh, due to this ultra or rather protective lung ventilation strategies? Now, there are many biological and physiological effects of this hypercapnia. And a lot of them are actually contradictory to each other. So let's take a look at that. Now, various biological effects. Now, these have been studied mostly in animal uh, models. Now, it does affect alveolar cells by reducing the microvascular permeability, reduces lung edema formation. It also decreases the lavage protein, I mean, the overall lavage protein content. In one of the rabbit models, it reduced or attenuated apoptosis of the alveoli, which was subjected to ischemia reperfusion injury. Now, the major mechanisms, it inhibits nuclear factor kappa uh, pathway, which ultimately reduces inflammation, also reduces or inhibits ADAM17 protein, thereby reducing apoptosis. Now, this is one of the slides, again, a representation quite busy. Majorly, it reduces or inhibits ADAM17 pathway, inhibits the NF kappa beta pathway, and also prevents uh, this ASK1 protein activation due to mechanical stress, thereby reducing inflammation, promoting survival, proliferation, and growth of the alveoli, and reducing apoptosis in these particular alveoli. However, coming on to the other side of the coin, there have been studies which also showed that it does cause hypercapnia, does cause impaired neutrophilic phagocytic activity and promoted higher bacterial colony counts in the lungs of these animals. Also, it induced apoptosis in the type 2 epithelial cells. Now, this was via a different pathway, nitric oxide dependent pathway. Dose dependent manner, it also impairs alveolar cell proliferation and delayed wound repair. So, on one side, we saw a lot of positive effects. On the other side, we are seeing a lot of other effects as well. Now, as far as effects on alveolar clearance are uh, concerned, hypercapnic acidosis reduces overall alveolar edema formation. Now, this it does mainly by reducing the capillary leakage, which could be induced by either free radical injury, by ischemic reperfusion injury, or even by high stretch ventilation to both in vitro as well as in vivo models. Now, yes, it reduces edema formation, but studies have also found it to decrease the overall alveolar fluid clearance. Now, this is mainly by inhibition or rather decreasing the activity of sodium potassium ATPase activity in the alveolar basal membrane. So I know a lot of doubts, a lot of confusion. So actually condition as such, I mean, I don't know how to react to the whole thing. What exactly is the role? So we'll move on to the physiological effects. Uh, airway resistance, it has got both direct as well as indirect effects. Directly, it uh, decreases airway resistance by relaxing the small airway smooth muscles in healthy subjects. Indirectly, systemic hypercapnia also causes vagal nerve mediated constriction of the larger airways. Net result, little alteration in the airway resistance. Diaphragmatic function, yes, it does impair the diaphragmatic function in spontaneously breathing patients. This is mainly via its effects on the vagal nerve. Clinically, whether it is significant, this needs to be further uh, elucidated and with various studies and all. Now, how about pulmonary vasculature? Now, respiratory acidosis is one of the most potent uh, stimuli to cause pulmonary vasoconstriction, which ultimately increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, the elevated right ventricular afterload, this may lead to circulatory instability. This is especially true in patients who already have a right ventricular dysfunction. And all these effects may actually exaggerate in ARDS as well. As far as oxygenating capacity goes, so it potentiates the overall hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as well. And this results in a reduction of overall intrapulmonary shunt 
which improves gas exchange both in normal as well as diseased lungs. Uh, lung compliance actually effect really varies. There have been certain dog models wherein it showed to increase the compliance, whereas in certain other mice model, it's showed to reduce the compliance. So again, quite varying effects, both physiologically as well as biologically. Effects on other organs, central nervous system, it increases cerebral blood flow, causes vaso cerebral vasodilatation. Uh, it reduces cardiac contractility, increases the heart rate, reduces the right ventricular ejection fraction promotes renal vasoconstriction and overall systemic vascular resistance it reduces by promoting vasodilation. So there are certain contraindications based on all this. Now, what are these contraindications? Patients with acute cerebral diseases, patients with coronary artery disease, heart failures, arrhythmias, or pulmonary hypertension. Why? Because Hypercapnia does increase sympathetomimetic output. So beta blockade may limit this whole activity. Uh, also patients with hypovolemia, because it induces systemic vasodilation, uh, it predisposes patients to develop shock. So this should be corrected prior to initiation of hypercapnic ventilatory strategies. So now the big question, what do the real world studies show? Now, majority of these studies are done on ARDS and sepsis, critically ill patients. Now, the largest study or the most quoted study, the ARDS network study, what it showed was the post hoc analysis when it was done. It showed that hypercapnic acidosis was actually associated with lower mortality. However, this was limited to the group of patients who received larger tidal volumes of 12 ml per kg body weight. When they compared this effect at lower tidal volumes of 6 ml, they found that there was no survival benefit in patients with permissive hypercapnia or patients who had normocapnia. So what it promoted was rather a hypothesis that lung protective ventilation actually reduced lung injury caused by the ventilator to a point where the protective effects of hypercapnia could not really be detected. So this was a recent uh, systematic review and a meta-analysis of role of this acute hypercapnia and mortality, also on physiology. Now, this was published recently in 2022 in intensive care medicine. Now, as far as physiology is concerned, we can see that there was actually an overall increase in cardiac index and there was increase in pulmonary artery mean pressures as well, what we already spoke about. Now, Mortality wise, there was basically no mortality benefit actually uh, when considering. Uh, I'm so sorry, my slides are not moving. So there was no mortality benefit actually with hypercapnia. Rather, what they saw was, was protective lung ventilation was what actually benefited all these patients as compared to hypercapnia. So both in hypercapnic as well as uh, normocapnic patients, mortality was more or less the similar. So what they assumed was that it was protective ventilation again, which actually benefited all these patients. Now, this was another paper which was rec uh, recently published in 2020. Now, uh, what it showed was patterns and impact of arterial carbon dioxide in patients with ARDs. Now, they also said when propensity match groups were done, mortality rate was 36% in both sustained normocapnic as well as hypercapnic patients. So there was no evidence which was found for either a benefit or a harm with hypercapnia as such. So that brings us to our next question. Now, is it the hypercapnia or is it the hypercapnic acidosis, which is probably harmful to the patients? So this was a recent paper uh, published in Annals of American Thoracic Society last year. So what they had done was they randomized about, they took about 3000 patients, uh, grouped them into five different cohorts. This was based on uh, exposure at various time intervals. Now, mainly this was done to account for time bias and also for informative censoring. Now, after adjustment for all key confounders, it was found that there was no independent association of hypercapnia with hospital mortality. However, in ventilated patients, presence of prolonged exposure to hypercapnic acidemia was associated with increased mortality. Now, this was as high as odds ratio of 16.5 when exposure was likely more than 120 hours of potential exposure, which was quite significant actually. 
So uh, this was, I just extrapolated this chart from the study. As you can see the highlighted portions over here in a rather busy slide, what you can see comparison with compensated hypercapnia and an uncompensated hypercapnic acidemia, you can see mortality was always higher when this acidemia was not really compensated or rather there was frank uh, acidosis in these patients. Now this was apparent even after 48 hours of exposure. And definitely it was more as the exposure reached up to 120 hours. Again, another interesting observation, this I've just plotted over here. You can see uh, when the carbon dioxide was between these two ranges, that is around 25 to 60, 65 uh, millimeters of mercury, the mortality was actually on the lower side. Uh, when it went beyond 60 or 65 millimeters of mercury, the mortality also started rising. Another interesting observation, what they actually saw in other studies have also corroborated, even with hypocapnia, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, you know, partial pressures of carbon dioxide going less than 20 millimeters of mercury was also associated with higher mortality. At least two or three studies have also corroborated this finding, which was quite interesting, actually. Now, this was another paper which was which showed effect of hypercapnia and acidosis on mortality in mechanically ventilated patients. Now, I've just uh, taken this table over here. As you can see, this, these are the three groups, normocapnia with normal pH, compensated hypercapnia and hypercapnic acidosis. So it's the acidosis which is associated with hypercapnia that causes high mortality, which is quite significant out here. So bringing on to our next question, that what exactly is the lower limit of pH that we need to target and how to counteract, counteract this acidosis? Now, there's been no consensus of, on this lower limit of pH. Usually, pH levels of more than equal to 7.25 are well tolerated. Uh, correction below this level can be individualized and it can be done via two modes, either via bicarbonate buffering, which is the most common clinical practice, or it could be done by extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal. So how to do bicarbonate buffering? Now, there is no ideal dosing strategy. Why? Uh, because usually you have to infuse a lot of plasma, you know, a lot of bicarbonate actually to produce just a modest improvement in acidemia as such. Now, there are papers and otherwise also, you know, uh, it has been shown that if you use carbicar, which is again an equimolar mixture of sodium carbonate with bicarbonate, this buffer improves acidemia much faster. Why? Because it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. Now, coming on to evidence, whether bicarb is actually helpful, uh, again, a lot of contradicting evidence. Now, this was one of the papers published in Critical Care Medicine 2009. What showed was buffered hypercapnia significantly increased both endotoxin and E. coli induced lung injury when compared to normocapnic controls. Now, again, renal buffering, uh, the whole thing actually worsened after renal buffering, which was independent of any changes in tidal volume. Another recent paper published last year in Current Opinions in Nephrology also sh uh, showed there was lack of any evidence that administration of soda bicarb for respiratory acidosis was actually beneficial in acute respiratory distress syndromes. In fact, they found to have some potential risk in terms of rather increased uh, infection rates for this study. Now, this was an interesting re read in American Journal of Kidney Diseases. Uh, can all go back and read this paper also. So what they suggested was that alkali therapy was not indicated for respiratory acidosis as simple acid-based disturbances. However, they recommended using alkali for severe acidemia either caused by mixed acidosis or due to permissive hypercapnia. Now what they actually said was blood pH to be targeted when usually it goes below 7.25. So again, has to be very individualized. Coming on to extracorporeal removal of carbon dioxide. Now, this approach has been tested and it is gaining a lot of traction of late. Uh, two trials where it was uh, you know, uh, tried out, they showed less lung injury caused by ventilation and in decreasing, decrease in the number of ventilation days. Another feasibility study showed that with ultra low tidal volumes also, it was successful in preventing hypercapnic acidosis. A recent paper, this was the supernova study. Now, this was a trial which was going on. Uh, it has also confirmed all these findings in this particular international multi-center randomized control trial. 
I think we'll be talking more on that in the later modules on, X, uh, on ECMO and ECCO2. So this brings us to our next question. What should be the rise the rate of rise of carbon dioxide? Now, usually the level should rise gradually during mechanical ventilation rather than rapidly, preferably at the rate of less than 10 millimeters mercury per hour. And this rate, uh, rate of rise should be even slower if carbon dioxide tension exceeds 80 millimeters of mercury. Is there any upper limit to this thing? There is no absolute level above which it should not rise. However, above a particular level, associated degree of acidosis usually limits uh, the whole hypercapnia. Levels usually higher than 100 mm are generally not required as far as various studies also go. So to summarize, real world studies suggest a survival benefit mainly due to lung protective ventilation rather than hypercapnia. Even though there is no survival benefit with permissive hypercapnia, it is usually well tolerated without being associated with an increased mortality. Now there are no recommended upper and lower limits for PaCO2 or pH. However, rapid rise in CO2 levels should be avoided. Acidosis usually less than 7.2 needs correction. And newer generation extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal devices may replace permissive hypercapnia completely and even facilitate ultra protective lung ventilation strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Samir, for that excellent presentation on uh, the hypercapnia, the pathophysiology behind that, and uh, how it is useful, and what are the um, um, parameters you look at. Thank you so much for that uh, nice talk. We'll go on to the next talk. Uh, the last one for today, Dr. Sudindra, can you please project your slides? Sudindra is a consultant, critical care medicine at Apollo Specialty Hospital, Jayanagar, Bangalore. He's uh, an accomplished intensivist with areas of interest, including uh, hemodynamic monitoring, mechanical ventilation, critical care sonography, toxicology, infection control, and nutrition. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Dr. Sudindra. And uh, over to you, Dr. Sudindra, please uh, present your topic. The topic is about nitric oxide. What is the role of nitric oxide in current uh, day practice in ICUs, especially in terms of mechanical ventilation uh, and respiratory failure? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sudindra, please. Uh, so my topic is nitric oxide and respiratory failure. I thank the ICA team, uh, Murulika sir and uh, Sanish sir for this opportunity. Uh, no disclosures. Uh, I'll be covering uh, this presentation with uh, some basic things. What is nitric oxide? Some interesting uh, facts about the history of nitric oxide, mechanism of action, the functions, uh, mechanism of action when we use inhaled nitric oxide in respiratory failure, some evidence currently, uh, uh, something about nitric oxide delivery device and administration. How do we administer? How do we wean off? And finally, we'll conclude uh, with these things. So what is nitric oxide? It is a colorless, odorless gas formed from nitrogen and oxygen at high temperature. It was widely regarded as uh, an air pollutant, mainly from the internal combustion engines, uh, factories, etc. And the oxides of uh, nitrogen contribute to the form formation of smog and acid rain, even affecting the ozone layer in the uh, troposphere. But interestingly, uh, there are remarkable effects in the human body, especially with respect to cardiovascular health. It is responsible for vasodilatation, which I'll be talking in the later slides, helps in the prevention of the plaque buildup. Uh, the nitric oxide levels in the body decline, as you can see here, with age, with every decade, there's a decline by 20%. There are nitric oxide supplements, which people use. There are foods which people seek to boost their nitric oxide level. So nitric oxide was uh, discovered by Joseph Priestley, Priestley as early as 1774. Back then, it was only known as a toxic and highly reactive pollutant. But later in 1980, scientists found out there is something called as EDRF, 
uh, endothelial derived relaxation factor uh, some chemical compound which is causing relaxation of vascular smooth muscles but it was only in 1987 that palmer et al uh, and uh, found out that this edrf is nothing but nitric oxide and published this in nature uh, work on nitric oxide also won the nobel prize in 1998 it was also the molecule of the year in 1992 so how does it actually act so nitric oxide endogenously is produced from l arginine which is an amino acid through nitric oxide synthesis there are different types of nitric oxide synthesis in the endothelium it is noh3 so this nitric oxide acts on guanyl cyclase uh, then uh, uh, leads to the production of cyclic gmp which in turn acts on the calcium channels inhibits the calcium entry and causes relaxation of the vascular smooth muscles this leads to vasodilatation there are other mechanisms as well so along with the smooth muscle relaxation it has other important properties as well like pro and anti inflammatory uh, properties it down regulates the leukocyte responses it decreases platelet aggregation facilitates neurotransmission augments bronchodilatation and even attenuates inflammatory responses so uh, coming to inhaled nitric oxide in respiratory failure as you can see here this is an image uh, of the normal ventilation perfusion happening here normal alveoli with normal uh, no, getting perfused normally here you can see this pathology in one alveoli this can be some low, uh, some uh, rest, uh, 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 pathology like low bar pneumonia so because of this pathology body activates the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction reflex causing uh, vasoconstriction of the less ventilated alveoli directing the blood towards the better ventilated alveoli this decreases vq mismatching what nitric oxide does is it augments this normal hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction reflex so hence more blood is diverted to a better ventilated alveoli and this decreases vq uh, mismatch even more be uh, better so when an in, uh, when an intravenous uh, uh, vasodilator like uh, a prosta glandin is uh, given it does not have a selective vasodilator effect like nitric oxide nitric oxide was very selective it only dilated a very well ventilated alveoli this dilates all the alveoli and actually is counterproductive uh, when you come to some disease like ards sepsis with, with, which which are very uh, generalized there is dysregulation of pulmonary vascular tone by the disease even here nitric oxide has some role uh, but i'll be talking about the evidence whenever we use nitric oxide for a long duration the effect tends to come down there are various uh, theories as to why is this happening one of the theories is with prolonged usage the nitric oxide from the well ventilated alveoli gets shunted or leaks to the less ventilated alveoli and abolishes the hpv reflex here and establishing shunt and this prevents the benefit which it which had initially offered so uh, nitric oxide actually uh, leads to better vq matching reduced pulmonary artery pressures reduced vascular pulmonary vascular resistance this leads to reduced rv afterload uh, better pulmonary capillary vas pressures and reduced pulmonary edema it has anti inflammatory anti thrombotic properties which might be helpful during ards so when this nitric oxide from the alveoli it enters the blood it is inactivated by hemoglobin to form meth hemoglobin it acts with the iron of the hemoglobin and forms meth hemoglobin initially when this uh, uh, nitric oxide was proposed as a therapeutic uh, measure they always thought that it is very safe because nitric oxide is getting uh, deactivated there is no there are no down, downstream effects but later uh, uh, study showed that nitric oxide leads to formation of reactive nitrogen species it reacts with plasma proteins especially the tyrosine group of uh, proteins and forms s nitrosol thiols and these can have some uh, downstream effects coming to evidence this was the first uh, study of usage of nitric oxide in humans It was uh, published in 1993 by rosie and et al uh, they compared inhaled nitric oxide with intravenous prostacyclin they uh, showed the data of 10 patients which uh, they were intubated for more than 2 uh, weeks 
and inhaled nitric oxide led to significant reduction in pulmonary artery pressures, increased PF ratio, improved uh, pulmonary gas exchange. In contrast to IV prostacycline, which did not, it actually increased the intrapulmonary shunt shunting and reduced the PO2. Uh, but when this inhaled nitric oxide was temporarily discontinued, this benefit of increasing arterial ox oxygenation uh, uh, did not exist. And the pulmonary artery pressures again came back to the pre-treatment value and there was no survival benefit as well. Uh, these are some of the RCTs which compared inhaled nitric oxide with placebo and most of them showed no benefit in their primary, primary outcome, whether it was the length of time on mechanical ventilation, reversal of acute lung injury, survival without the need of mechanical ventilation. There was no uh, evident uh, 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 favor towards uh, nitric oxide usage. Interestingly, uh, a study by Dellinger et al. in 2012 uh, showed that pulmonary function test values were better in ARDS patients six months after using nitric oxide. There's no control group here. The reason for this benefit is not very clear and there were some flaws with the study as well. And there, was, there were no data on the pre-morbid pulmonary function test values. So this is one of the systemic review on meta-analysis of usage of nitric oxide in ARDS. Combination of 12 trials and 1,200 uh, uh, patients by Adhikari et al. Uh, as you can see here, the PF ratio of 24 hours, all the trials favored nitric oxide. So nitric oxide definitely uh, helped in incre increasing the oxygenation in increasing the PF ratios. However, when you look at the mortality, mortality was worse with nitric oxide. Interestingly, uh, they studied the effect on renal dysfunction and four trials out of the 12 trials showed that there was increased renal dysfunction occurring with the usage of nitric oxide. The other eight trials, uh, there was no much data on renal dysfunction. So the reason for this renal dysfunction is not very clear. Uh, it is said it is because of inhibition of mitochondrial enzymatic functions and damage to DNA and membranes, uh, but it is very controversial. Uh, if you look at the studies of non-ARDS patients where nitric oxide was used, this dysfunction was not observed. And uh, very interestingly, even in AKI, when it is ischemic AKI, uh, there are trials which use nitric oxide donors like L-arginine. And it has a better, uh, nitric oxide has a better effect on the uh, renal vasculature as well. So in spite of improved oxygen, oxygenation, why there was no translation to better outcomes? Because we know in ARDS is a complex process. People don't die, all of them don't die because of refractory hypoxemia. Most of them die because of multi-organ failure. So even if you improve oxygenation, it may not turn to good outcomes. And oxygenation may not be directly related to the severity of lung injury. There are so many other things in MODs which decide oxygenation like shock. So the effect of uh, nitric oxide is very unpredictable. It may be long lasting and uh, favorable for one patient and it may not work for another. The reason is not very clear. And there can be some potential harm like renal dysfunction, which I already spoke about or methemoglobinemia. Other applications, I'll not be going into the detail. It is also useful other than ARDS in sickle cell disease, acute chest syndrome, in weaning from ECMO, in cardiopulmonary bypass, etc. Mainly, uh, the application started and it is FDA approved for uh, pediatrics for persistent primary hypertension of the newborn. So, something about the ox uh, nitric oxide delivery device. So, this is the device which gives oxygen, and it's called Inomax. So this is just like an anesthesia workstations. There are machines which are MRI compatible as well. So there are two nitric oxide cylinders connected and this uh, is the uh, control panel. Uh, you can see here a zoomed view. There are different alarms here. Uh, this is oxygen and uh, nitrogen dioxide and nitric oxide. This is the dial to increase uh, nitric oxide parts per million. So because we are using nit oxygen and nitrogen, there'll be production of nitrogen dioxide, which might be harmful to the patients if exceeded beyond the limit. So there'll be alarms for each of this. So this INO system will be incorporated into the uh, uh, inspiratory uh, tubing. So how do you administer? 
there is no clear consensus about the dose about the indication etc but this is a very nice uh, article from the spaniard group uh, where they say indication should be refractory hypoxemia where pf ratio is less than 100 p plat is more than 30 in spite of optimized respiratory support in spite of optimized ventilatory strategy in prone position and whenever there is uh, when prone position is contraindicated there is immediate high risk of death or damage due to hypox hypoxemia because we know clearly that uh, nitric oxide can increase uh, oxygenation you take an informed consent and administration is done such with a system such that it delivers constant concentration of nitric oxide in, into the inspiratory limb irrespective of whatever is the respiratory demand and dilution with oxygen or air mixture generally it's oxygen when it's a respiratory failure so how do you dose it so this article says start at 5 ppm there is uh, no uh, again no consensus the different trials have used different doses there is no clear dose response relationship so start at 5 ppm it is increasable uh, 10 to 20 parts per million maximum is 40 most of the trials have uh, uh, used below 40 and whenever you use above 80 for a long uh, 80 parts per million for a long duration only that can cause clinically evident um, methemoglobinemia otherwise most of the trials are have not shown any clinically significant methemoglobinemia. So ABG is done in 30 minutes. So how do you know whether there's a positive response or not? There should be an increase in PAO2 by more than 20%. And this is evident in the first hour. And if it is evident and more than 20%, continue at the same uh, dosage. If it is not, if it is less than 20%, increase to 10 to 20 parts per million and check ABG in 30 minutes. So dose adjustments have to be made daily so that you get uh, the minimum effective dose which gives the adequate systemic oxygen uh, arterial oxygenation just like optimal peep so whenever you want to come down on the dose you should ensure that po2 doesn't drop more than 20 percent if it is dropping less than 20 percent you can continue at the reduced same reduced dose and at the next interval you can try reducing it again but if the reduction is more than 20 percent then you come back to the uh, pre-weaning po2 and then reduce it at smaller decrements how do you monitor it? So continuous monitoring is done with alarms for nitric oxide, alarms for nitrogen dioxide. So nitrogen dioxide should not exceed one part per million. Some uh, uh, this thing guidelines say 1.5 as well. So if it exceeds, then reduce the uh, inhaled nitric oxide dose. So you monitor oxygen saturation, co-oximetry for methemoglobinemia, ABG 30 minutes after starting and every eight to 12 hours. Uh, see to it that you maintain methemoglobin less than 5%, some articles say less than 3%. You can do a daily platelet count, renal function and coagulation profile as well. So when do you withdraw? Withdrawal is uh, very important and it has to be done uh, uh, very slowly because whenever you give giving external uh, nitric oxide, it suppresses the endogenous production. So when you take it off immediately or whenever you withdraw it very uh, fast, so there'll be very refractory uh, pulmonary hypertension causing uh, RV failure, refractory hypoxemia, even shock. So you have to do it very slowly. So you do it once the oxygenation has improved and the patient has stabilized. You can consider when PF ratio is more than 150 with FIO2 of less than 80%. Uh, when you're coming down from 20 parts per million, reduce it in larger uh, uh, decrements like 5 to 10. They've even given the sequence 20, 10, 5 every 8 to 12 hours. When you are reduced by, uh, you have reached 5 parts per million and you are reducing it further. So you decrease it in smaller uh, decrements like 5, 3, 1 and every 6 to 8 hours. When you reach 1 part per million, maintain it for 30 minutes and then turn off completely. So conclusion, it should not be recommended as a standard or a routine treatment in ARDS. It is only a rescue measure. It definitely improves oxygenation PF ratio, but this effect does not last long. There are trials which have compared placebo with uh, nitric oxide and after three to four days, the effect of nitric oxide is the same as placebo. Sometimes, uh, as I said, it is not predictable. Sometimes patients, the effect lasts up to one week as well. So there's no mortality benefit or reduction in the length of stay. Effect not predictable in everyone. Then how is it helpful? It can transiently help to reduce the FiO2 and PEEP and helps reduce the negative effects of high FiO2 and uh, reduce the barotrauma because it can increase the oxygenation. 
and you know, it will give time for the primary pathology to settle. But in refractory hypoxemia, it can help you buy time to bridge over to a more definitive measure like ECMO. There is a nitric oxide uh, society as well, where the researchers collaborate to and work on nitric oxide. This is headquartered in New York. And they have a journal as well with the uh, impact factor of 4.5. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhindra, for that uh, wonderful presentation of uh, the role of nitric oxide in treatment of respiratory failure. Thank you very much for that uh, lucid presentation. Well done. And uh, can I request Dr. Ratan Gupta to take over and moderate the discussion? So we have, uh, we have had four topics. One is the high flow nasal oxygen therapy, prone ventilation, hypercapnia and nitric oxide uh, in the treatment of respiratory failure. So any questions, comments are welcome. Ratan Gupta, are you there? Hello, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, that was a very uh, extensive presentation uh, regarding uh, different aspects of uh, managing a patient with hypoxemia and uh, uh, different strategies uh, with the uh, nitric oxide uh, and uh, taking care of patients, uh, allowing them to have uh, higher carbon dioxide level. Um, so I don't see any questions on the chat box. Uh, my question... Uh, uh, my rather comment uh, to Dr. Himaldev uh, is uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, apart from uh, HFNC, which is very good uh, in patients with uh, severe hypoxemia, uh, there is one recommendation uh, which has come uh, in patients post-operative, especially uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation. So initially, there was a doubt whether it works uh, well or not. In a high-risk uh, category of patients, uh, they have a recommendation that uh, uh, you can electively plan for uh, putting these patients on uh, NIV post extubation so that chances of failure uh, comes down significantly in these patients. Uh, your comment on that, uh, Dr. Himaldev. Yes, sir. I think it's a, a very valid comment. And uh, there has been a conditional recommendation for this as well. And uh, uh, immediately post-operative post patient, especially the high-risk patient, obese patient, Post-op cardiac and thoracic surgery patients, they definitely benefit if you put them uh, on a high flow. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, good recommendations uh, actually uh, towards pro towards the high flow and definitely it should be considered for these patients. I agree with you, yes. Uh, to get the ball rolling, can I ask one uh, simple question to Himal? Uh, can this high, pre, uh, high flow oxygen therapy be given using uh, oxygen concentrators? Suppose. Um, no, yeah. sir. I, you cannot give it through the oxygen concentrator because it requires a very high concentration of oxygen. And it has to be blended with the air as well. So it, it requires a blender. So you need a, a proper oxygen source. And it cannot be given with the cylinders or the oxygen concentrators. You need a wall mount uh, oxygen source. Uh, yes. okay. uh, Himal, uh, there's also um, um, concern regarding whether uh, uh, HFNC really gives a positive pressure uh, 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 ventilation, uh, unlike uh, NIV where you can actually measure it. Uh, the rise uh, in uh, pressure in the airway, uh, has it been recorded? Yes, sir. Uh, so generally the uh, they have done a couple of studies where they correlate at around 60 liters per minute, that is the maximum high flow. Uh, you can uh, get the peep of appro approximately around 7.5 to 8 centimeter water. So approximates to every 10 liters, approximately 1.2 centimeter of uh, peep is, is uh, uh, given to the patient when using a high flow. Suppose you keep the mouth open, so you lose around two centimeter of water of peep. So if you keep the mouth closed, you can uh, get up to eight centimeter of water of peep. 
so that's a very valid point and um, it is beneficial that's what uh, i have discussed also the dynamic positive airway pressure and that is also a basis of uh, usage of high flow in the case of hypercapnic hypercapnic respiratory failure type respiratory failure because the peep which is given by the high flow it can act as a uh, an, a little bit of um, intrinsic peep which can contract the auto peep right. and uh, Right. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Kumar Belan has raised his hand. Dr. Kumar Belan, do you want to say something? I enjoyed the presentations. They were very high quality. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yes. Was, uh, do any of these things translate to the pediatric population also? Uh, any of you know whether that's true for pediatrics? I know that we use a lot of high flow nasal oxygen to prevent intubation and also to allow successful extubation in pediatric patients with lung problems. Uh, how about uh, whether these findings that you all presented hold true for patients with severe lung disease from COVID or other infections? Do they translate to pediatric population also? Uh, so thank you for the question. Yes, definitely it translates to the pediatric population. And uh, there has been a specially designed pediatric nasal cannulas as well for them. And even the flow rate has been uh, adjusted accordingly. That is around two liters per kg. And um, uh, it has been beneficial in these pediatric population, especially when the uh, pediatric uh, population has a hypoxemic respiratory failure. Not only that, also when the child is extubated and avoid the risk of reintubation, it has been used in the pediatric uh, Patient population. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And we do use it. And in patients who have borderline uh, blood gases, it helps uh, in maintaining the oxygenation. And uh, uh, especially it works very well with a small, tiny dose of dexmedetomidin infusion in patients uh, in children that I have personally seen being working very well. And we do use it in small babies. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Samir, may I ask you, is there any risk of cerebral edema in these patients uh, who are given, uh, uh, who are made hypercapnic for the sake of uh, protective lung ventilation? Is there any study which has recorded intracranial pressures when the PCO2 jumps up to 60 or something like that? So, uh... Thanks for that, sir. In fact, there are studies who right. have done this thing. I mean, they have measured for every uh, 5 to 10 centimeter uh, millimeters mercury right. rise in carbon dioxide, how much does the intracranial pressure also increase and whether that actually corroborates to, uh, you know, development of cerebral edema, so as to say. So there have been studies and they have not been able to determine a significant threshold level as such for it. But yes, there is always risk for it. Therefore, uh, already a systemic hypertensive patient maybe sometimes or uh, patients with acute cerebral diseases, it has yes. become an absolute contraindication. Absolutely. Yeah. But exactly. overall, whenever they have seen uh, in you know all these studies which I just quoted, uh, carbon dioxide level which goes up rather than you know having an imposed hypercapnia, you have a permitted hypercapnia and even if in certain studies, it has gone up to 100 millimeters of mercury also yes. without really causing significant uh, clinical effects secondary to uh, maybe increased intracranial pressure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just one, one point to add, sir. Yes. Uh, there have been studies where they have noted the neurocognitive disabilities after such uh, where, uh, high CO2 levels where you are trying to attempt uh, ultra low lung protective ventilation. That is where the vino venous ECMO comes into picture. One of this, don't they have headache if they are breathing? Uh, I, I think these patients are all ventilated, so the question of headache doesn't come into their sedated. That's fine. Yeah. And uh, there's a question in chat box how much oxygen is needed in a day? I think the question pertains to the first talk. Himalde, uh, Himalde would, would like to answer that. How much oxygen is needed in a day? That's the question. It, it is not uh, specified. Uh, I, I'm sure they're talking about high flow nasal oxygen. Yeah, I think it's uh, pertinent to high flow oxygen. Yes. I think, um, uh, see, it's about how much liters of um, the flow is set in the high flow machine. Yeah. Um, so if you see if it is 60 liters per minute, 
it's almost equal to how much a ventilator uh, uses because even in the inspiratory we uh, in, in the ventilator we set the flow set around 60 liters per minute so uh, that's the amount exactly you cannot calculate but it has to be depending upon the patient's use right, so, right. Big, big amount of oxygen unlike it will be 60 multiplied by 60 multiplied by 24 hours <laughs> yes. you have to you have to make sure you have that much supply Absolutely. in the system but on the ventilator, it is not everything is oxygen. Whereas HFNC, everything is oxygen. That's yeah. So yeah. you need to, that's yeah. a very relevant question when there's an oxygen demand in the whole country, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Sanjay, would you like to comment or say anything? Dr. Sanjay, OP is there? Yeah, uh, it was a, a very nice presentation from all the speakers. Yeah. Just one question to Dr. Bansal. You did mention bicarbonate therapy in, uh, in uh, permissive hypercarbia. So am I right in making an assumption that uh, you meant in patients who had an element of metabolic acidosis as well, in addition to respiratory acidosis, or were you particularly talking only about respiratory acidosis? No, so, uh, exactly, sir. Again, quite actually a good question because when I was preparing the talk, even I had the same sort of doubt. So, what they say is that, yes, uh, like two of the studies which I quoted, what they said was that for a pure respiratory acidosis, especially if it is above the pH is above 7.25 or the equivalent, it actually does more harm than good. So, it is not required. And one of these uh, papers on the perspective in kidney disease journal, what they said was you rather use it when there is a mixed acidosis or in other papers wherein they used for when there is hypercapnia as a role uh, or rather just plain respiratory acidosis, you correct it when it goes below 7.2. That is when you can have some benefit. Again, because most of the studies show uh, evidence of uh, what do you call uh, mortality with increasing acidosis. So that's where the whole bicarbonate buffering comes into picture. Now, reflex is that, yes, we increase the respiratory rate or uh, maybe increase the tidal volume a bit, not really in these cases for ARDS. Uh, but bicarb buffering may be helpful, maybe not. Again, a lot of contradiction. Yeah, because that's an interesting concept because we do have patients who go into RRT when they are on ECMO. And when we do have these cases, when we increase the dialysate flow to maybe say 500 ml per hour, we do realize yeah. that our sweep gas flows also increase mm -hmm. in those patients. So that is why it becomes quite important to select your oxygenator quite carefully when you're on VV rather than in VA. Yeah. There was just a curious uh, question basically that uh, how do you tweak it to get rid of that extra bicarbonate load, which is going to manifest as a high PaCO2 in a patient in whom you are buffering actively. Exactly. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, that was a good point. Um, I would uh, uh, ask Dr. Sudhindra, do you have any experience of giving nitric oxide to extubated patients? Does it work in them? Uh, I have not used it personally, sir. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, Belani, do you have any idea about this? Like, I think I, uh, nitric oxide should help whether a patient is intubated or not. I think uh, making sure that you have accurate delivery yes. is the key. All right. And I think uh, making measurements would be a good idea to show that that's happening, especially in the exhaled component. Right. Uh, Rankish, uh, Rankish, yes. can you throw some light on uh, uh, this awake uh, proning in uh, COVID patients? I think you had cast some doubt uh, regarding the role of uh, awake proning. Yeah, sir, uh, the studies basically have, a few studies have shown that it is uh, beneficial, it prevents intubation, but uh, the latest study has shown that it is not going to prevent any intubation or uh, not going to change mortality. That is the latest article in uh, JAMA 2022. Till then, I was also under the impression that it works beautifully. But uh, there are both type of studies where it is uh, new, uh, uh, not much beneficial. In fact, it can be harmful also. Okay. Uh, 
but there are positive studies also so we are still uncertain about how useful it is but uh, i am sure we have found it to be reasonably useful in, uh, in our set of patients who had severe covid uh, yeah even we have used it sir but only thing is we have probably not compiled to see when we used it what happened when we did not use it what happened or what was the outcome whether it got delayed in certain for example in uh, uh, wave second wave we had so many patients ventilator were not there uh, we used awake proning so many patients got delayed we intubated them very late so such patients did not do very well probably if we put them, put them into numbers then probably the mortality would be very high so this is based on the studies uh, results on i was just talking about the awake proning results mm -hmm. and i think none of us have compiled uh, so much of data mm, that is true that is true the mother that i just found one study so yeah. inhaled nitric oxide and spontaneously breathing covid patients prevented need for mechanical ventilation and at right. least 50% oh oh that's great that's great yeah thank you for that point are there any other questions or comments i think one uh, thing that these in these uh, presenters can probably investigate when you're using this high flow nasal oxygen yes what are local manifestations in the nasopharynx over a period of time has anybody looked at that to see whether there is tissue damage from that high pressure and whether that relates to duration and pressure so that would be something worthwhile to do shouldn't be too hard to check that out mm. yeah we do have some experience in the post operative uh, post extubation patients for hypoxia yeah. it worked quite well and i have not come across uh, many complications in a uh, short duration hfnc is for two days three days uh, but i don't think i can correlate that for the ards uh, group of patients might be good to just do a fiber optic exam and get some pictures and uh, see how it looks you know it, it might not be a bad uh, quick evaluation to and get a publication out of it also with some nice pictures yes yes what we what yeah go ahead man <laughs> now what we noted is uh, a lot of sinus discomfort in the form of headache when you continue right. to use uh, high flow nasal cannula um, yeah. because they were all covid patients probably we did not bother to check uh, do sinuscopy and all that but uh, what we could how we could help them was break from hfnc to uh, the nrbm break hfnc for several hours and use it like niv breaks we used to give hfnc breaks and that became a routine practice in our unit to give breaks from the high flow nasal cannula because it is little more warm especially as himal said probably 37 is the best temperature when you do not know that it has been set up at 40 a uh, lot of discomfort uh, many patients have complained especially the sinus discomfort is what we have observed that's yeah. our experience <coughs> the other thing is uh, The other thing worthwhile investigating might be that when you use high flows, or you can actually uh, see if the titrating oxygen will be helpful, but keep the flow pressure high, so that uh, you're may maximizing the peep benefit at the same time you're weaning oxygen. Is there a risk of uh, oxygen toxicity if you're giving hundred percent oxygen with high flow? not sure about it sir but there's not much of a literature on that oxygen toxicity part but um, definitely if you look at the literature the complications for high flow one of the most common complication is an epistaxis the local injury yes 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 and uh, probably uh, if you look at the the further deep inside nasopharynx and all if the humidification is good mm. uh, uh, there may not be a, a injury there down but it's always better to have a proper study proper fiber optic evaluation probably we need to um, Uh, hold a study on that and uh, probably do some research on that and oxygen toxicity part i'm not very aware of that yeah, yeah. so that's why yes 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, dr belani followed by chetan 
the, that's why I was suggesting for trying to see if controlling the inspired oxygen but keeping the high flows with uh, nitrogen or air at the same time to see if that'll keep the peep effect but at the same time minimize oxygen use. So it might not be a bad thing to evaluate. Yes. Thank you. Chetan, you have raised your hand sometime back. Do you want to say something? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, my question is to Dr. Venkatesh Gupta. Yes. So, any comments on uh, prone ventilation on VV ECMO, Dr. Venkatesh Gupta? Yeah. Uh, if studies wise, I do not know, but many, many centers have used it. We have also tried in one of our patients. Okay. Little cumbersome, but doable. How it really helps, I am not sure. Okay. Uh, studies wise, I am not sure. But it is many centers have used it, and What's it your is experience? One of the, our experience. We have done. We have done close to nine twenty uh, ECMOs. We know when ECMOs during the COVID. Only one patient because he was not at all getting better. The we could not wean ECMO. We tried. Uh, uh, Prone ventilation, but it did not help much. Eventually, he got decannulated, but not immediately after that. Uh, he uh, longest take we did, I think, uh, close to six weeks. We routinely use it. I think Sanjay, uh, Sanjay will be able to tell us better. Sanjay, are you there? Yeah, we do routinely prone at times. I wouldn't say in all our BV runs, but we do, you know, go down the proning route. The primary reason why we tend to prone VVs is if we need positional drainage of certain segments of the lung. Like, for example, if you have somebody with possibly a lingular collapse on the left side and you are unable to expand that with your conventional therapy, that is bronchoscopies or high peep, we tend to prone them and we get our physiotherapists involved quite actively to percuss and then to vibrate that aspect of the lung so that all the debris comes into the main airways. And when we make them supine, we practically bronch them immediately once we get them to supine position. And this is something we have realized has improved our outcomes. The second thing you need to bear in mind when you're proning on VV is the fact that when you initially prone them for the first couple of hours, your sweep gas flow will go up. If your sweep gas is going up, please don't take that as a deterrent to proning. It is not something which is telling you that, no, it's not working on the physiology. The reason why the sweep gas is going up is whatever debris you are gravitationally draining is going to soil the other segments of the lung. And that is why your sweep is going up because when you achieved a reduction in the sweep initially, you are using the native segments of the lung to contribute to that aspect of ventilation. But then when you prone them, you are actually causing the other areas which are actually opened up to start getting debris into them. So there is going to be a concomitant increase in sweep. But as long as you know that and you know that you're actually doing it to clear out a particular segment, when you get them back to supine, you bronch them and you physio them, and within a matter of another 48 or 72 hours, your x-rays will start clearing up again. So it's a bit of a double-edged sport when you prone patients on VV ECMO. But if you are judicious in whom you do it, I think you'll get away with it with good results. What, 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 what is that, what is that uh, uh, thing that makes you uh, consider proning? Uh, during the renal like for example, I've got a patient currently whom I've proned on VV. Now he has got a lingular collapse. Okay. And for some reason, the bronchi, the second level bronchi are quite edematous in him. And I'm unable to get that particular segment of the lung to drain. So if you look at the X-ray, there looks like a potential space in that middle zone of the left lung. And I can't just get that to work. Now I have proned them and it's, it's a matter of time now with my closed suction, I'm seeing a lot of muck coming out. So I know that with percussion, yes, I'm going to be able to get that lung to aerate when I turn him supine in about 15 or 16 hours time. But yes, my sweep gas will go up. So if I'm, if I'm probably running a sweep of one when he was supine, when I prone him, I'll probably be running at four. But that's what I would normally expect because the other segments of the lung will get soiled by my maneuver. So that's how you decide. It's, it's, it depends again. Like, you know, a lot of people 
they don't they uh, you find it difficult to gravitationally uh, drain something in the lower lobes because conventionally all patients on ECMO are all ventilated patients are kept at a, a particular 15 20 30 degree head up position so when you do that it becomes difficult for you to gravitationally drain the lower segments if you go halfway through that, if you put them on a lateral position and then you try to drain them from there, yes, it is an effort, but it may not give you the entire result in a very short time. Yeah. So you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and decide with whom you're going to go the full Monty and then decide whether that will actually help. It can be a double-edged sword. I, I do agree to that. It can be a double-edged sword, but if you are judicious, it will pay you off. Because the theoretical benefit of drainage of secretions in prone ventilation is very modest, but this is probably yeah, what you are telling should be considered. Theoretical yes. benefit is very modest for drainage of secretions in prone ventilation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, contribution. And uh, I think there are no, if there are no further questions, are there any more questions or comments? Uh, if there are no questions, it's my pleasant duty to thank all the participants, uh, in particular Dr. Ratan Gupta, Chetan, and Sanjay O.P. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as Dr. Belani pointed out, all the presentations were of high quality. Uh, if I may use the word outstanding, very good presentations. Himal Dev, Venkatesh Gupta, Samir. And Sudindra, all of you have done very well. And uh, I concur with Dr. Belani that they were uh, good, very good presentations. And on behalf of uh, on behalf of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I uh, thank you for joining us. I also thank all the audiences who are present for being with us this evening. And we'll be coming with another module on mechanical ventilation on 7th of September. Please join us. That will be on tracheostomy and uh, VV ECMO. And thank you very much again. And see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.